A quick disclaimer before we get started, while our show is created for mature audiences, today's episode details a sexual assault case, which can be particularly difficult for some. Viewer discretion is advised. On Halloween night in 1992, Candace Foley was working her shift at the gas station when her boyfriend stopped by. They talked for a bit, but things got heated and their argument turned into a screaming match, resulting in her boyfriend storming off. Candace was pretty shaken up after that and decided to drive to the nearby hospital where her best friend was working so she could try to calm down. It turned out her friend wasn't working that night, but the nurse she talked to could see how upset Candace was, so she suggested she waited for a doctor to look her over just in case. So she sent Candace to an exam room to wait for an on-call doctor to help her out. The doctor on call that night was a man named John Schneeberger. Candace actually knew John, in fact. He was her personal doctor and had even delivered her baby. By that point, Candace said she was no longer hysterical and was starting to feel a little silly about the whole thing. When Schneeb suggested a sedative to help her calm down, she figured he'd give her some pills to relax her muscles and maybe help her sleep that night, so she was like, okay, yeah, that sounds good. But when she saw the doctor starting to prep a needle, she was like, whoa, hold on. Before she could protest, he quickly crossed the room and jabbed it into her arm, and immediately she was starting to feel dizzy. Candace described her body going numb and said that she lost control of the muscles in her body and fell onto the bed. She tried to scream, but no sound would come out, and she was absolutely terrified. While she didn't remember a lot of what happened after that, Candace was certain that her last memory was of John forcing himself on her. When she regained consciousness a few hours later, Candace was alone in the exam room. She sat there trying to process whether or not the last few hours had actually happened, but the sickening feeling was there. It definitely wasn't a dream. She decided that John would not get away with this and started rifling through the drawers of the exam room until she found a plastic Ziploc bag. She sealed her underwear carefully inside and hid it in her purse. Candace tried to leave the hospital then, but was too dizzy to drive home and the nurses suggested that she spend one more night there. She did, and the next day when she saw Dr. Schneeberger, she confronted him. She was like, what the hell did you give me? And Dr. Schneeberger immediately was like, why? Did it give you wild dreams? And with that response, she knew without a doubt what he had done and that she was going to have one hell of a fight in her hands. When Candace was finally released from the hospital, she went straight home to her parents and told them what happened. Her mom and dad could tell just by looking at Candace that something very bad happened to her. Candace decided that she needed to prove what Dr. Schneeberger had done, so she drove herself two hours out to a clinic for testing. So not only did she have to suffer the night in the exam room, she now had to go out of her way to get poked, prodded, and swabbed by more doctors just to prove she'd been assaulted. Candace handed over her bagged underwear where they found evidence of assault as well as traces of fluid still in her body at the time. Candace also wanted to know for her peace of mind whether she'd hallucinated the whole thing or not. Tests showed that Candace had been assaulted and injected with a medication called Versed, a pre-anesthetic used to numb and paralyze your body before they give you the actual anesthesia. When Candace formally accused John Schneeberger of the misconduct, you can imagine what kind of trouble it stirred up around town. Everyone immediately suspected that she was lying because Schnee was a respected member of the community. Never had anyone accused him of something like this, or anyone else in the community for that matter. A lot of people thought that Candace was in love with John and wanted to be with him. Or maybe, being a single mother, she was hoping to get some sort of financial compensation out of it. Or maybe she was telling the truth and we could just believe women the first time? Like, I promise this isn't something women just cook up for fun. This event absolutely destroyed Candace's life. People also thought it was suspicious that Candace hadn't said a peep to the nurses while she was at the hospital after it happened, or when she was asked to spend another night there. But Candace was like, well, yeah, of course they wouldn't believe me. I just told the police and they don't believe me. It was a 20 year old single mother's word against professional doctors. Who did they think would win? To put an end to the rumors, John agreed to give a blood sample for DNA testing. However, when they compared John's DNA against the samples collected from Candace's body and clothing, it wasn't a match. The town was relieved to hear this, but Candace was shocked. There was absolutely evidence that she'd been a victim that night. That was for sure. But it wasn't John? How? Candace was certain no one else had been in the room with her that night except for him, but the DNA technology didn't lie. It couldn't lie. She told investigators that was impossible and there had to have been some sort of mistake. But with the test conclusively showing that the DNA found on Candace's body didn't belong to Schneeberger, the police felt the investigation was closed. Months passed and the people of Kipling tried to put the whole controversy behind them, but for Candace, she refused to give up the fight. She insisted that someone must have tampered with the DNA evidence. After consistent canvassing from Candace, John agreed to give another DNA sample almost a year later to prove that it hadn't been tampered with the first time. This time, a registered nurse drew his blood while a police officer watched to confirm it hadn't been tampered with. The tests were run, and once again, John was not a match for the DNA found in Candace's kit. Candace, of course, still didn't believe it. At this point, she knew it would be hard for anyone to believe her after two conclusive tests. Supposedly, this new DNA thing was the be-all, end-all to cracking these types of cases, hey? But Candace was certain 
somehow, some way, John must have tricked the system. Candace's parents stuck by her as well, saying they knew that the doctor had to have been up to something that night, especially because of the strong sedative found in her system. John said that Versed was known to cause hallucinations and tried to use that as the explanation for what Candace allegedly remembered. But if Candace had dreamt it, how do you account for the you know what kit that found evidence of, well, the you know what? Something wasn't adding up. Candace also maintained that the last time she had been intimate with someone had been weeks before that night. So there was no way the physical evidence present could have been from a different time. With no other evidence and no other explanations, the police closed Candace's case once again in 1994. By now, the town of Kipling had completely turned on Candace and she was pretty much ostracized by most of the residents for what she'd done. Desperate to prove she wasn't a liar, Candace hired a private investigator who was willing to do the things that the cops weren't willing to do. And technically speaking, not allowed to do. The PI broke into Schneeberger's car and plucked some of John's hair off of the headrest and swiped a tube of chapstick he'd found in the console. Candace paid out of her own pocket for a private lab to test the cells from the items found in John's car and compared against the DNA found on her test kit. This time, when experts ran the DNA test, the cells from John's chapstick proved to be an exact exact match to the DNA found on Candace. Finally, Candace knew she hadn't hallucinated it and that she wasn't crazy, but she now faced the impossible task of proving that this well-loved doctor had not only done one of the most despicable acts a person can do to someone, but that he also managed to fool the experts twice. And with that came two problems. Number one was that they couldn't prove the chapstick found in Schneeb's car was actually his, because technically it could have been someone else's. And number two was that they couldn't tell the police what they'd found because they'd literally broken into someone's car without a warrant. But most important of all, if that really was John's DNA that had been found on Candace's body, then how in the hell had he managed to hoodwink the computers with his hemoglobin? Candace filed a lawsuit against Schneeberger and brought charges against him with the local medical society. In the hearing, Candace sat directly across from Dr. Schneeberger's wife, who glared unblinkingly at her throughout the whole proceeding. Lisa Schneeberger's icy stare sent the message to Candace loud and clear. How dare you? Candace said she just sat there thinking, you are so stupid, and if you don't look out, the same thing is going to happen to your kids. Have I mentioned how much I adore this woman yet? John agreed to do yet another blood test on camera for the police with a forensic scientist during the procedure. In the tapes, the scientist asked to prick John's finger, but John insisted that he had a condition that would cause his hands to bruise, so he'd rather them use his arm instead. Because he was there voluntarily, they technically couldn't force him to do anything, so the scientist agreed to take the sample from his arm instead. This time, when the forensic scientist inserted the needle, nothing came out. That was odd to her because she had noticed what a particularly large vein it was too. She figured the vacuum pull in the tube of the needle was busted, so she grabbed another needle and tried again. But that McFlurry machine was out of order. Finally, she managed to get a trickle out and she thanked John for coming in and he left. And then perhaps one of the best moments of the entire case just so happens to get caught on camera that would ultimately play a major role in helping bust this up. As the cameras kept rolling, the scientist squinted at the tube and frowned and kind of shook it like an etch-a-sketch. The cop was like, what is it? And the scientist was like, it's weird. It just doesn't look fresh. The sample was too degraded to be tested in the system and the forensics team had to tell Candace that there was nothing else they could do. And Candace was like, oh, what the hell? I'm not sure when, but at some point the investigators were made aware that the chapstick from Schneeberger's car had been a match, which was why they'd allowed for a third round of testing. The police were now heavily suspicious over the fact that the DNA on the chapstick had been a match, but because John had volunteered the three DNA samples that the computers ruled out, their hands were tied. Candace was devastated. The testing was supposed to be the thing that would prove Schneeberger had done this, and it failed her every time. Years would pass with Schneeberger continuing to practice medicine and Candace being known as the attention-seeking bleep who tried to take down an innocent doctor. Candace's ordeal had left her with little money, few friends, and a town that completely turned on her. But finally, five years after the alleged attack, there was an unfortunate break in the case. Schneeb had struck again. The police got a call from one Mrs. Lisa Schneeberger who reported that her biological daughter, John's stepdaughter, had just told her that her stepdad had been assaulting her for years. She confided with her mom that growing up, her dad would often come into a room at night and give her injections. Lisa had also gone through John's things and discovered a box that contained contraceptive, needles, and bottles of Versed. In perhaps one of the worst come to Jesus moments in all of human history, Lisa realized that Candace had been telling the truth all along. When Candace heard the news, she said she started bawling because that's what she'd been screaming at the top of her lungs for years and no one would listen. She couldn't believe it had happened again and she felt awful. Lisa said she still blames herself to this day for never seeing it. John was arrested and ordered to undergo, you guys guessed it, DNA testing. But this time, the detectives had learned their lesson and took DNA from everywhere, including hair from his head, saliva from his mouth, and blood from his finger, 
not his arm. This time, all three DNA samples taken from John were an exact match. When Candace found this out, it was like Christmas morning. She felt terrible that it had to happen to someone else, but was so thankful that finally Schneeb the Dweeb had been caught and that he wouldn't ruin anyone else's life again. And finally, the burning question of how Schneeb had fooled his previous DNA test would be answered. Were you able to figure it out? On the stand, he finally revealed his secret. He had surgically implanted a plastic tube filled with another patient's blood in his arm. That was why he insisted they draw blood from only his left arm instead of his finger, and why the scientists had so much trouble getting a sample during the third test. Sure enough, you can go back and look at the real tapes taken from when John had gotten his blood drawn, and you'll see that he always wore long sleeves and was careful to only roll them up in a certain spot on his elbow. Any higher, and they would have seen the scar from the incision on his bicep. For one moment, when John rolled up his sleeve in the tape, the investigators could see a tube bulging underneath his skin. And by the time the scientist was performing the third DNA test five years later, the blood was completely old and dried up, which was why it was too degraded for testing. Schneeberger was found guilty of the crimes, was stripped of his medical license, and his wife divorced him. Now get ready to get very angry. How many years in prison do you think they gave him? Wait, first, how many years do you think he deserved? They gave him six years. That's it. In 2003, John was released on parole after serving only four teensy years. His wife wasn't happy with that, so she reported him to the immigration authorities and told them he'd obtained his Canadian citizenship illegally and got him deported. Last anyone heard from him, he was living with his mother back in South Africa. And that is the unbelievably insane story of how one doctor was able to fool the entire town, his wife, and the experts, but not Candace Foley. While it's clear from this story that the justice system in a lot of countries is still very broken when it comes to protecting victims and supporting survivors, we can all learn a lesson from Candace when it comes to never giving up and fighting for the truth.